Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Center for International Governance, or CG, as we say. My name is Fred Kuntz, and I'm the Vice President of Public Affairs here at CG. I'd like to begin tonight by thanking our public event sponsor, Wordsworth Books, for their ongoing support of CG's signature lecture series. We also extend a warm welcome to those joining us from around the world through our live webcast. Following this evening's address, we welcome questions from both audiences. Our live audience here is invited to use the microphones in the aisles. And if you're watching online, you can ask questions through the live chat function on your screen. And we'll pass those questions along to our guests, to our guests on the stage through this uh, monitor here. Five years ago, we witnessed what is now commonly known as the global financial crisis of 2008. As markets collapsed, blame flew arousing new distrust in the global economy and the institutions responsible for maintaining sustainability and governance. Tonight, Paul Bluestein will present his controversial findings on the failings of the International Monetary Fund and the Financial Stability Forum as penned in his latest book, Off Balance, The Travails of Institutions That Govern the Global Financial System. Through interviews with policymakers and through thousands of pages of previously undisclosed documents, Bluestein will offer insight into the serious vulnerabilities of our governing institutions. Paul Bluestein is a senior fellow with CG, as well as an award-winning author. Prior to his current position, uh, Mr. Bluestein worked at the Wall Street Journal and Forbes magazine, and spent much of his career as a staff writer for the Washington Post. He's focused his career on the workings of organizations such as the IMF, and brings a unique perspective to our lecture tonight. Mr. Bluestein currently lives in Kamakura, Japan with his wife Yoshi and their four children. Please join me in welcoming Paul Bluestein. Wow. Um, well, thanks very much. Uh, I just want to start off by saying uh, what an honor it is uh, to give this lecture and to be a senior uh, fellow at CG. And I want to emphasize that I'm spelling honor with a, a U, um, being an American citizen. Um, I, Carol Bonnet, who is the um, uh, publications editor at CG and who, uh, and who with uh, Jennifer Goiter, um, uh, the assistant publications editor, edited a lot of my books, had to change a lot of the spellings of my words, so maybe she'll appreciate that joke. I, I'm sorry, I, I apologize if it's a hackneyed thing and, and if every American who comes here says, makes the same joke, but um, it sure occurred to me. Um, I wanna start by talking about a meeting that took place in March 2007. Um, 40 policymakers from around the world uh, met in Frankfurt, Germany to assess risks in the global economy they were meeting in their capacity uh, as members of the Financial Stability Forum. And I know there are some people, certainly people from CG here who are quite familiar with that group, but perhaps some of you are hearing that name for the first time. Um, it was certainly a very little known group, um, very secretive, uh, and they came from central banks, finance ministries, regulatory agencies, and international organizations around the world. Now, I'm sure you uh, perhaps recognize that fellow um, in the lower right there, um, Mark Carney, who is your former uh, uh, central bank governor and is now governor of the Bank of England. And uh, no doubt many of you recommend the fellow, recognize a fellow in the upper left, uh, Tim Geithner, who was then president, at the time of this meeting, was president of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. And next to him is Mario Draghi, who is now, was then governor of Bank of Italy and now uh, uh, president of the European Central Bank. Uh, in the lower left, I doubt many of you recognize uh, Nout Welling, who was the uh, Dutch central bank governor and was, was more importantly the head of a group called the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision. And then next to him is, uh, in the middle there, is Don Cohn, who was the uh, vice chairman of the U.S. Federal Reserve Board and was, was recently uh, regarded as a fairly leading candidate to succeed Ben Bernanke as head of the Fed. So these were the kinds of people who were going to meetings uh, of the uh, FSF, of the, of the Financial Stability Forum. And when I say they were highly secretive, um, they weren't like, quite like the National Security Agency in the United States. They, um, they did have a website. They did acknowledge their existence. They did acknowledge that they had had meetings, but they would never release anything more than a very, uh, very cursory, very anodyne account, uh, just saying, you know, these are the issues that were discussed. And they wouldn't even say who had actually attended in terms of naming them by name. Um, now, at the time uh, of this meeting, just to set a little bit of historical background, you remember that in, in around that time in 2007, uh, using uh, the U.S. housing market was starting to show a lot of signs of strain. 
There had been a report issued a few days earlier before this meeting showing that foreclosures had reached record levels in the fourth quarter of the previous year. Some, a bunch of mortgage lenders had gone bankrupt, uh, including a new century, uh, which is one of the more famous ones, was just about to go bankrupt. And there was a big headline in the New York Times just a couple of, week before, couple of weeks before this meeting saying, crisis looms in market for mortgages. So for the, this group called the Financial Stability Forum, um, this was the uh, sort of development, whether, deciding whether that posed a threat to the global economy, that was, that was really what they were there for, and that was the top item on the agenda uh, on that day in March of 2007. One of the people attending the meeting was a man named Randall Krausner. Um, and uh, he was the governor of the Federal Reserve, U.S. Governor, uh, U.S. Federal Reserve. And um, as you, this is a the, these words that you see up on the screen here are from the confidential summary that was circulated to uh, attendees and other officials who were part of the Financial Stability Forum after the meeting to summarize what had happened and actually naming people who would, who would, and what and saying what they had actually said. And um, I apologize for the quality of this scan. There is kind of a funny story about how, these docu how I was able to get these documents and how I scanned them, but I won't go into that now. But anyway, you, I hope you can sort of read it. Um, uh, it says, Randall Krosner uh, noted, it was important to recognize that the market segment affected variable rate subprime mortgages only constitute seven to eight percent of the overall US mortgage stock. And then he went on to say, the secondary market liquidity for these securities has not dried up and there has been little evidence of spillover to other market segments. So this was a pretty soothing view that he expressed uh, at this meeting. Now, it's not surprising that a governor of the Federal Reserve Board would make such a statement because a lot of them were saying the same thing publicly at the time. What's interesting is that he, no, nobody at that meeting said anything to the contrary. The, um, that, that document that I just showed you, uh, I mean, the rest of it, if you look through the rest of it, there's nothing, nothing there to indicate that anybody um, said anything to the contrary. And one of the people I, uh, who was there, uh, who I talked to, he didn't want to be named by name, but this is, he made some really interesting observation. He said, nobody around that table said this is not believable. We basically sat there and formed our own views. And he went on to say that this was quite typical of meetings that he attended of, this, of the Financial Stability Forum. He said, there was great defensiveness and excessive politeness. It was interesting to talk to clever, thoughtful people about subjects that were my daily bread and butter, but it wasn't something in which you went away thinking, I've got a real sense there's a problem developing, so now I'm gonna do this or that differently. I don't think that in the pre-crisis period, I ever got that sense from the FSF. And this is, I think, what's really interesting about this observation, I mean, to say that those words, great defensiveness and excessive politeness, that's the kind of thing one hears often um, in, in casual observations, but also in sort of the scholarly literature about these, a lot of these international groups. You know, it's very important that people from, official, top officials from, from different countries get together. They get to know each other, then when a crisis arises, and they're really in the crucible of, of a, you know, it's terribly urgent that they make decisions. They know each other, they've met each other, they've, they've eaten and drunk together, they, so that they know each other. That's all important. But, human nature being what it is, and certainly bureaucratic nature being what it is. Um, although these people, one of the reasons to bring them together is so that they'll kind of push each other and say, hey, we've noticed this problem in your country. We, we really think you ought to do something about it. It might affect us. But they don't, they tend not to do that. They tend to be, there tends to be great defensiveness and excessive politeness. And one reason for that is, of course, you don't want to be mean to the other guy if you've gotten to know him and like him. But another reason is, you're afraid if you do that to him, Maybe he'll do it to you at the next meeting, right? So, so it's a kind of be, these things become kind of mutual protection societies. So the central point that I make in my book, and the central point I'll be making um, this evening, is that the failings of the Financial Stability Forum and other international economic institutions cast profound doubt over the governability of the whole global economy. One of the most important upshots of the crisis, in my opinion, is that the world needs much more effective international economic institutions than the ones we now have. Why do I say that? Well, I think there are two overarching imperatives that, that face the world in, in the, in the, in now in the years after the crisis. The first, of course, is to make sure that the recovery is sustained and that we don't fall back into recession. And that in turn requires, I mean, that requires a lot of action by individual countries to do the right thing, but it also requires a fair amount of international coordination. 
countries getting together and agreeing that they'll do certain things together. One, of the, one important aspect of that is to try to rebalance the global economy because we have a lot of countries that have been running deficits of various sorts, budget deficits and, and trade deficits. They've been consuming more than they're producing. And those countries, uh, some of them have already had to impose austerity and, and the, my country, uh, the United States, is at some point going to have to impose a fair amount of austerity. And you don't want all countries imposing austerity at the same time. You want the surplus countries, the countries that have room to, to expand and to stimulate, you want them to do that to re, and to have run lower surpluses to bring in more imports so that they're helping to counterbalance what is, what is going on in the other countries. So that requires some coordination. And the second imperative is to enhance the stability of the global financial system so, it be, so we're let, it's less prone to the type of crisis that we had. And that requires a lot of, again, a lot of coordination to, to work out the kinds of rules that countries can all mutually agree on and that make sense uh, and, and that strengthen the system and keep it more stable. And to do that, that's going to require adroit action by international institutions. And there are really four major ones that govern the global financial system. The, the top two, I'm sure many, most of you uh, have certainly either heard of or you know a good bit about, the International Monetary Fund and the group of 20 major economies. Um, are you know, in the news a lot. Now the two on the bottom there, um, again, I know there are people here who are quite familiar with these, but for those of you, some of you may be, may be hearing about them for the first time. The Financial Stability Board is the successor body to the Financial Stability Forum, and I'll be talking in a minute about how, or how similar they are. Uh, it's, their names, of course, are quite similar. Um, and the other one is the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision, which sets rules for international uh, banks, uh, particularly for the amount of capital that they have to hold. And those two, uh, those two lower, the, two, uh, the third and fourth one that listed on the, on the slide there, um, are based in this building, um, you see at the, at the picture in the bottom, which kind of looks like a nuclear cooling tower or something, and that's the Bank for International Settlements. In, it's in Basel, Switzerland. Now, if you agree with me so far, if you're with me in saying, yes, we, we, we need to have more international coordination and we need good international institutions to uh, make all that work, then I've got a dispiriting story to tell you, and it's, it's a story I tell in my book and a story I'll be focusing on this evening. It's a detailed account of the failings of certain international institutions before and during the early months of the crisis. And specifically, I'm talking about the FSF, the Financial Stability Forum, the, the, the group that I talked about at the beginning. And the other one is the IMF, specifically its efforts to, to address um, global imbalances, the global imbalances in trade and capital flows I'm talking about here. And it's, as, as, as Fred said in his uh, kind introductory remarks, it's, it's based on interviews with scores of policymakers that I've talked to, but also um, a lot of confidential documents that show what was going on behind the scenes at, in these, um, at these institutions. These are, include memos. Um, uh, notes of meetings that people took, um, and uh, meetings that people were sending, uh, emails that people were sending to each other, um, and some, the, so these are some of the some of the people I interviewed were kind enough to share that kind of thing with me. Um, some, of course, threw their hands up in horror and said, "No, no, you can never have that for me." But some people um, were, uh, you know, for the sake to help me write a historically accurate uh, book, were willing to, to to share that. And I want to emphasize, I'm not in any way suggesting that these institutions caused the crisis. I don't want to be misunderstood. Um, I'm not saying they caused the crisis or even that they played any kind of contributory role. But what I am saying is that their failings expose the weaknesses and limitations of international economic institutions in general. And for two major reasons. First of all, they can't discern where and how crises are likely to arise or even pinpoint where the most dangerous vulnerabilities are. And as a result, they're less able to write the kinds of rules that that are likely to, to keep the system stable. And second, they don't have the power and they often lack the will to stop countries from pursuing policies that threaten the stability of their neighbors. Oh, excuse me, I'm sorry I said I have neighbors with a U. Oh dear, okay. Um, or even the stability of the entire financial system. That really was an oversight. Um, just noticed. Um, now, uh, as some of you I'm sure know, these are not novel observations to make about international institutions. Um, and they're not confined to the four institutions that I talked about either. They're not confined to institutions that deal with global finance. There's a book out recently by a man named Mark Mazar, um, Governing the World, and I just came across this quote um, uh, a couple of days ago where he, and it, you know, you can see that in this quote, what he's talking about is all of these sort of problems that involve, that require international coordination, climate change, financial instability, poverty, crime, disease. Um, so 
he, you know, these are all things that, that it's, you know, come out a lot better if, if, if countries work together through effective international uh, economic institutions. And he goes on to say that with the World Trade Organization's Doha round paralyzed and the World Bank chastened, the IMF incapable of helping to rectify global imbalances that threaten the world economy, and no single agency able to coordinate the response to global warming, the institutions of international governance stand in urgent need of renovation. So he's not just talking about the, my, these institutions that I'm focusing on. But at the same time, I mean, again, these points um, may in some ways um, seem almost obvious, but if you, uh, unless you really take an in-depth examination of specific cases, um, you can't really fully appreciate them. And I guess, you know, there are books, um, there's a certain genre of book that's, that's um, it says, you know, well, you thought that A was, that a was true, but actually, no, I'm going to show you that B was true. And my book is a different kind of, uh, different genre. It's a genre of book that says, well, you, you know, it, it sort of dimly you know that A is true, but let me tell you, it's much worse than you thought. Um, so if you look behind the scenes um, and look up close and really see what these institutions uh, do and uh, what their problems are, then you can appreciate a lot more, I think, what the, what, how, how, weak, uh, how weak they are and, how, and, and what a big problem we have. So I'll start by talking about the Financial Stability Forum. And um, so this portion of the talk, uh, I'm, this is a chapter title from my book, which I'm borrowing from, Global Watchdogs Missing a World of Trouble, kind of summarizes what I'll be saying about the FSF. Now, as many of you know, um, at least those of you who are familiar with this, with this body, you know that it doesn't exist anymore. Technically, it's, it's, it's gone. It's, it, it's, uh, it's closed up. So why should we care? Well, first of all, its primary aim was to coordinate efforts in preventing and mitigating future crises. And it does really, although it's, it technically no longer exists, it really does live on in the body that replaces it, it the body that replaced it, which is the, the Financial Stability Board. And that, when, up, when the FSB was created in April of 2009, it was touted by the G20, which created it, as a real formidable new force on the global stage. This is going to be a, a very important institution alongside the IMF, the World Bank, the World Trade Organization, we're going to have this fourth pillar of global economic governance. That was, those were the exact words that Tim Geithner used as Secretary of the Treasury when this thing was unveiled. So this is, a, this is intended to be a really serious body. And like the FSF, the FSB, they have this very similar membership. I mean, the, there's more countries in the FSB, but they all both consist of officials from central banks, finance ministries, regulatory agencies, and international organizations. Now, you're wondering why I have a picture on this slide of Captain Barbosa from, from Pirates of the Caribbean. Well, be, that's because both the FSF and the FSB are what's called, they're, they're soft law bodies. Soft law means that they're not treaty-based organizations. They're not, there's no legal enforceable, legally enforceable obligations that they're all obliged to follow. These, these bodies can't make any country do anything. You remember the scene from Pirates of the Car Caribbean where Captain Barboza, he's, first he's being told, you know, but the pirate's code says you have to do, you have to make, you have to take me to safety. And he looks, he looks at the young woman and he says, the pirate's code. Well, the pirate, that's more, more guidelines than actual rules. So whenever you want to think of what soft law means, think of Captain Barbosa and you'll get it immediately. And the point I want to make about the FSF is that its record doesn't bode well for the FSB, this body that, again, was created in April 2009 to, to, to great ruffles and flourishes. Um, now, I'm not going to say that the FSF completely missed the boat, didn't see anything wrong with the, in the financial system. It, I've looked through, again, you know, I don't know, I lost count of the number of pages of no, handwritten notes of meetings, um, uh, uh, confidential minutes of meetings and so forth that, that, uh, that people shared with me to see what, what was talked about at these meetings. And what came, you know, all the factors that ended up causing the crisis, we know now, the housing bubble in the US, uh, the purchase of, of risky mortgage securities by, uh, by big financial uh, firms, uh, what was going on at the credit rating agencies with all their conflicts of interest, all those, things, all those things came up for discussion. And in fact, I was really interested, as I, as I read through these, I would sometimes, suddenly some, some, some comment would just jump off the page at me because it was so prescient, and one of them, was made in September 1999 by Nout Wellink. Again, he was the Dutch um, uh, central bank uh, governor. And he said at an FSF meeting, are we creating banks that are too big to run, too big to supervise, too big to fail? Hmm, he was using that term way back then, okay. 
However, as I went through these documents, what also really came through is that the, current, the concerns that people expressed didn't come close to matching the seriousness of the situation as we later understood it to be. And one reason for that was the attitude of the American participants. And here's, I'm showing you a comment from a man named John Taylor who was then, um, he was the Undersecretary of the Treasury in the first Bush administration. And this is a comment that he made, which he confirmed making to me. Uh, he confirmed to me that he, that he made this. He said this to the chairman of the FSF. Um, he said, the forum is writing all these things about problems. He's talking about a report that they had done on hedge funds and offshore financial centers. He said, can't we write about things that are going well? And the head of the FSF thought, well, you know, yes, that's not really why we're here. But anyway, this reflected an attitude that people in the Bush administration and, and to some extent the Federal Reserve had, that as long as things seem to be going well in markets, um, you know, markets would take care of themselves. They would discipline themselves. This, this attitude has kind of been mocked, uh, you know, the term market fundamentalism. Um, but it did, it did reflect a genuine belief um, on a part of a lot of these people that, you know, you could trust the heads of banks to, um, you know, to keep their, uh, you know, to not take um, recklessly um, imprudent risks with their stockholders' money because, after all, bad things would happen to them. That was, that was their belief. Now, having said that, um, I don't, I'm not just saying this because I'm a U.S. citizen. I don't think it's fair to pin all the blame uh, for the F, what, wrong, what went wrong at the FSF on the American participants. I talked to a lot of attendees who said, well, you know, you go to these meetings and, and they, they use these terms like boring and that, they, you know, it's just a lot of hot air. And there was a very odd paradox about this because they were really, a lot of them were really trying hard. They were sort of scouring the horizon for, for problems. And at every meeting, a lot of the same ones would come up. They would think, well, what if there's an avian flu epidemic? What would that do to, to the financial system? When Argentina defaulted on its debt, they were very concerned about that, paying a lot of, what are the, what are the, what's the fallout from that? What if the Doha round, the WTO's Doha round of trade negotiations falls apart? What if there's a geopolitical event, like a, like a terrorist attack? What will that mean for financial markets? Um, what if there's a collapse in the dollar? Now, and this was their job. I mean, this was their, what they were charged with doing, was to look around and try to see any kind of danger that might materialize. But the problem was that as they went to meeting after meeting, and these things kept coming up and kept coming up, that the meetings began becoming repetitive and boring and lacking in any kind of direction. So I'm going to take you through one meeting. You, you, you probably want to, you know, instead of me just telling you that, you might, I'd, I'd like to show it, show it to you. This is a meeting that took place in September 2006. And that's a, that's a really, I think, a, this is a good meeting, partly because I have really, really good notes of what was said. But um, that's, this is less than a year before the crisis really first began to materialize. The crisis began and really began to show its ugly head in August and September of 2007. That wasn't the worst stage of it, but that was where it was, some, you know, when people went, uh-oh, we've really got a problem. And this was also the first meeting chaired by Mario Draghi. Um, he was uh, then governor of the, of the Bank of Italy. Um, and this meeting took place on the 6th of September 2006 in, uh, in Paris, as you can see. So this is from a document that was circulated. Um, it went by various names. Um, it generally, it was called the Vulnerabilities Assessment. And this was put together by a really high-powered group of people from all these various agencies that, that were part of the FSF. And they would try to look, they would again, they would look around to see um, what should be discussed at these meetings? What are, the, what are some of the worst problems we have? Um, so this document, uh, again, I apologize if, if I think it's since the screen is so big, maybe you can read it. But anyway, you can see it says, the list of prominent vulnerabilities is broadly unchanged since the previous meeting. However, the changing macroeconomic environment may have increased uh, the probability of one or more of these vulnerabilities would be worsened, and so on. And then it goes on to talk about housing markets in the United States, and it says, more signs, uh, more clear signs of significant cooling, yes. Um, the limited data available for the U.S. suggests in the aggregate, uh, the increase, uh, they were talking about the, you know, the fact that interest rates would go up for some of, the, some of the mortgage holders. That will be spread out over a number of years, so the impact on the household sector as a whole is likely to be gradual. But they say all oh, these issues warrant continued close attention. Yes, they did. So then they go on to say, okay, what are the areas that we ought to consider at this meeting? And they say, well, the benign conditions of recent years may be approaching a turning point. Boy, there was a real understatement for you. They say the potential remains for heightened volatility ahead. Boy, did it ever. 
Then they go on to say, it may be useful to consider events which would cause substantial unexpected shifts in behavior across many financial market participants, um, and the possible triggers include, they have this list. You can see it here. I've underlined a significant slowdown in growth, acceleration in inflation, and further jump in commodity prices. Those are, that's one list. Potential for one or more large corporate defaults. And they have an increase in geopolitical tensions. Again, what if there's, what's a, what if there's a terrorist attack? They worried about this a lot. Failure of international trade talks, worsening of global current account imbalances. And then they conclude this section by saying, any of these shocks would be likely to have an impact. A worsening of one or more vulnerabilities could in turn raise the materiality of others. So again, they're doing their job. They're looking all over the, all over the landscape for problems. But they're, so they're seeing everything, and yet they're seeing nothing. And this, these are comments from um, the members' discussion. Th these are from handwritten notes, which I, I was re a bit reluctant to put up on the screen, just in case there might be somebody in the audience who would, or um, watching online, who would be able to recognize the handwriting of the note taker. But anyway, these are, these are some of the comments from the handwritten notes that, that I thought were most interesting. The first is from Xavier Musca, who was the uh, uh, chief of the French Treasury. He said, financial markets are changing rapidly with huge interconnections. Better interaction among regulators and crisis management war games are needed. And that was a, kind of an interesting, good comment. Susan Byes, who was then a governor of the US Federal Reserve, said that US housing prices are not sustainable. OK, well, that was a good thing. But then, then she went on to say, but price rises are slowing. They're not falling. And the strength of the labor market should offset any setbacks in housing. Mm, not so, not so farsighted. Callum McCarthy, who was the chief regulator for the United Kingdom, said that banks in his country were in sound shape. And then he went on to say, broader, the broader question is how households will react if home prices fall. Well, that wasn't quite on the mark, was it? And then Nout Welling, again, who was the uh, head of the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision, said, excessive mortgage lending will affect households, but not the banking system, except through reputational risk. Not, not so good, not so, not so sharp. So uh, anyway, I won't go into any further detail in this meeting. The, the, the bottom line here is that, is that FSF members, again, they were, they were aware of these problems that we now are familiar with today and that we, you know, they've been dissected in minute detail today with benefit of hindsight. So they were aware of these problems, but they weren't very concerned about them. And the remainder of this meeting, again, this is in September 2006, was mainly concerned with other things like private equity, um, the potential for a hard landing in China, that seems kind of funny now, doesn't it? Um, uh, they were concerned, about, they talked about global imbalances and international accounting and auditing issues. Now, again, the crisis began to get underway in August and September of 2007, when markets first began to quote unquote seize up. And at that point, the FSF really swung into action. They said, oh, oh, you know, Houston, we got a problem, right? And the G7, the group of seven major industrial countries, mandated the FSF to prepare a broad response to the crisis. So the FSF formed an ad hoc super elite team, which they called the Working Group on Market and Institutional Resilience. And they produced a report. So they, again, they really got geared up in September of 2007. Uh, and they produced a report, which actually had quite an influence uh, uh, on what was decided later by the G7 and eventually by the G20. But if you think this means that in September of 2007, when this was all getting started, that finally the FSF was saying, oh my gosh, we've got a problem, now we see what needs to be done. If you think they were finally getting ahead of the curve, um, here's the evidence, here's the most com compelling evidence I found that, that to show that they weren't. So in September of 2007, again, this is when the crisis is first beginning to, to show itself. They, did, they thought very sensibly, let's have a worst case scenario. And again, I'm not sure if you can read this, but it says it may be useful to review a number of ongoing risks, how they might evolve, and what a worst case scenario might look like. Well, that's a very sensible thing to do. And here's what they came up with. A downside risk, in other words, this is, this is their worst case, is that a core financial institution encounters severe financial stress. Well, I mean, a worst case scenario, I mean, that's really, you're, I mean, when you, you use your imagination and you think, all right, plausibly, I mean, not the worst, you know, not the world, you know, not a meteor hit strikes earth and blows it all to pieces, but what's the worst plausible scenario for the financial system? Well, six months later, guess what happened to that worst case? Worst case scenario, it got worse. Because, of course, uh, the F people in the FSF saw that they really hadn't been imaginative enough in September of 2007. And at that point, their worst case scenario, is, if you look at the document that was circulated at that meeting, 
It says, a worst case scenario would be the distress or insolvency of one or more large and complex financial institutions. And they go on to say that this would include the widespread dislocation or even contagious failures within the core of the system. Now, you've heard me, I hope I haven't sounded too mocking. Um, I mean, I suppose, I suppose I have. I probably haven't been able to resist. But I don't mean to sound at all as if I mean that these people are stupid. They are not. They're a lot smarter than I am. They're a lot more knowledgeable about how financial markets work than I am. And they're very dedicated public servants. Um, I mean, there are exceptions. There are some who can't wait to, to get into a, a high paying job at Goldman Sachs or whatever, or whatever other big Wall Street firm you might think of. But a lot of them really, really care about doing their job right. I, I, you know, this really comes through to me in talking to people. Um, so I'm not trying to cast any aspersions, but this is precisely what makes their failures so much more frightening. Because if all we had to do was replace incompetent or venal policymakers with really good, good, sincere, competent, smart ones, well then we wouldn't have any problem managing the global financial system. But that, the problem is a lot deeper than that, and that's what makes the problem so frightening. And that same point I want to emphasize applies to the other uh, institutions covered in my book. And I'll be talking now, I'm just going to switch now to the IMF. And in this seg segment, uh, uh, I'm, I'm calling this a flop and a debacle for reasons which will become apparent to you. Um, that's again a chapter title from my book. And again, to set, just briefly set a little historical background. The, the big problem that everyone was worried about in 2006, 2007, as I'm sure many of you remember, was, was, was global imbalances. And it's still, it's still a, a big issue, but it was, it was, it was a, a huge matter of concern for a lot of economists and commentators and, and policymakers at that time. And a number of countries were involved. There were two standouts. One is my country, which with all its overconsumption, its binging on, uh, uh, on real estate, uh, heavy dependence on inflow of foreign capital. And the result of that was that great big growth in the green line on the right you see there, the, that's the growth in the U.S. current account deficit. And the other country, the other big standout was China uh, with its tremendous export machine uh, going into high gear and its undervalued currency, which was helping to make Chinese products cheap on world markets. The result being that rising line you see over there, China's current account surplus. And the big worry was, of course, that thing that you see over there on the left was, was a, the big worry was that this would all lead to a collapse in the dollar and have a lot of ramifications for the global economy. Now, the IMF decided, well, this is something we really need to do something about. And that was a very sensible thing for the IMF to do because it was set up to, to police the international monetary system. And so, all right, we're going to do something about this. Well, the upshot of their efforts, one was a flop and one was a debacle. The flop was called the multilateral consultations, and the debacle was, the, was called the 2007 decision on exchange rate surveillance. Now, um, again, I know there are people in this room who are quite familiar with these, and they, and they know uh, quite well that neither of these ended well. News reports, scholarly uh, commentary have made that clear for a long time. But again, to fully appreciate how utterly feckless um, and weak the fund was at inducing policy changes in its most powerful member countries, if you look what went on behind closed doors, you can, you, again, you can, it, you, you can really uh, gain an understanding of this. And again, I'm going to be making use of, of extensive evidence from, from confidential documents that people shared with me. Now, the multilateral consultations, I'm going to be very, very brief on. There's a lot more in my book about the multilateral consultations, but <clears throat> the IMF, unlike the FSF, um, you know, there's no Captain Barbosa here. The, the IMF is a, is a hard law body. Um, it's, it's, it, it is a treaty-based organization, and, and member countries do have certain legal obligations that they're expected to fall, follow. But um, the multilateral consultations were, were not a hard law exercise. This was the IMF basically trying to get some big economies together for, for a big meeting and to try to agree on things. And so I'm calling this singing kumbaya and five-part harmony. This was the, but this was their attempt to use moral suasion, the soft law side of the IMF. So. Um, the five big economies were the United States, China, Japan, Saudi Arabia, and the Eurozone. And again, I go into a lot more detail in the book, but because this other, this other IMF initiative is a lot more interesting and revealing, I'm going to skip, skip to that. But just to make the point that these multilateral consultations just didn't go anywhere. The countries involved, uh, the big economies did not agree to any, do anything more than what they were already doing. So it was a flop. 
But this much can be said for it, um, that although the outcome was a flop, compared with the other initiative uh, that the IMF undertook at this time, it was not nearly so dismal. And that was the 2007 decision on exchange rate surveillance, which was the, this is the debacle. Um, and here you see the IMF using its, more of its hard law side. The idea was we're gonna have, we're gonna have rules. These aren't gonna be just, these aren't just guidelines. These are rules that countries are expected to follow. And there'll be provisions for identifying violators. And countries that are found to be violating the rules will be, will be subject to special consultations. So it'll be a diplomatic embarrassment for them. And the key phrase in this rule was the, was the term fundamental misalignment. The countries aren't supposed to have fundamentally misaligned currencies. Now, this term did not originate in the IMF. It originated in a bill that was introduced by Senators Grassley and Baucus, Senator Max uh, 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 Baucus and Senator Chuck Grassley, big powerhouses on the Senate Finance Committee. And that bill was aimed at China. And they had this bill with this term fundamental misalignment in it. And the IMF, under US pressure, basically borrowed this term. The US Treasury, which basically uh, 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 has a lot of influence uh, on the IMF executive board um, because the U.S. is the largest shareholder of the IMF, the U.S. Treasury was applying a lot of pressure uh, to the IMF to adopt this rule against having currencies that are fundamentally misaligned. And the obvious reason was they wanted the IMF to put China in the bullseye and target it. And this memo from uh, October 6 of 2006 shows the kind of pressure that the U.S. Treasury was bringing to bear on the IMF. They were, this memo says, the Treasury made it clear that they considered the decision critical. And it goes on to say, that it wasn't just that the Treasury was saying, hey, hey, we really want you to do this, and you ought to listen to us because we're an important country. They were, they were using a kind of leverage. There was legislation pending in Congress at that time that the IMF really wanted passed for its own financial viability. And the Treasury was kind of saying, well, maybe we won't, maybe we won't do anything to get that passed through Congress. So there was a kind of a, a, a threat that, they were, that, they, that, that, that was underlying this pressure. Now, the, in the IMF, there were, there were huge divisions about this, both within the staff and also on the executive. The executive board is, the, is a group of about two dozen people who represent the 187 member countries. And the people who supported it, a lot of very powerful people, including the managing director, Rodrigo Dorado, who's a Spaniard. The people who supported it said, you know, this is what this institution was set up to do. And at the Bretton Woods Conference in 1944, when the IMF was created, John Maynard Keynes, who was the great, really intellectual visionary behind the IMF, wanted an institution that would do ruthless truth-telling. And when countries were violating the rules and doing things that, that might destabilize the system, the IMF would point to them and say so. So if China has a currency that's fundamentally misaligned and that they're, they're really kind of cheating to get an advantage in world markets, well, yeah, that's, then if that's true, then the IMF, it's the IMF's responsibility to say so. But at the same time, they thought there's another very important principle of multilateral institutions. Their rules are supposed to be symmetrical. In other words, they're supposed to apply, and what Keynes wanted was a system that applied to deficit countries as well as surplus, surplus countries as well as deficit countries and big countries as, as well as small. They would be even-handed rules. It wouldn't, they wouldn't just be targeted at, at, at one group because then that would, that, that would, that would uh, impair the functioning of the global economy. So this memo reflects that. This is a memo that was written by a man named Mark Allen. He was director of the Policy Development and Review Department, which is the most powerful staff department at the, at the IMF. And he's writing to the managing director and deputy managing directors, and he's saying, look, if we adopt this rule about fundamental misalignment, it may be seen as a concession to the US because after all, you know, this, this Senate bill by Grassley and Baucus has the same language in it. But, he says, the way we're writing it, the principle will be applied to all countries, including the United States. Well, June 15, 2007, there was a meeting of the executive board and it was very hard fought and the Chinese director was very opposed to this because he knew that the rule would be, would be applied to the Chinese Remnant or he feared it would be. So, and it was a real, a very rare meeting because normally these meetings are extraordinarily boring. They're all kind of pre-cooked in advance, but this one was really hard fought. And finally, a large majority voted in favor um, with the U.S. in favor of this rule. And the managing director, again, Rodrigo Dorado, was so excited that this thing that he had fought for had passed, he invited the staff for a champagne toast in his office. You've all heard the cliche about prematurely uncorking the champagne. And that cliche applies literally 
and with force in this case, because they did prematurely uncork champagne to drink it. And the reason I say that that cliche applies literally is because having approved this decision, the IMF turned out, as we'll see, to have no guts to implement it. So immediately after the board passed its, after the champagne had been drunk, that is, a couple of days after that, um, there was a meeting at which there was a big discussion. Which currencies are we going to try to bring to the board, kind of haul before the, the judges of the, of the international monetary, of the, of the people representing the, 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 uh, the international community to say this currency is fundamentally misaligned? And the Policy Development and Review Department, PDR, they said, well, let's, we think there are three currencies. China's was the obvious one. And they said the Japanese yen, too, could be argued. It could be fundamentally misaligned in an undervalued way. And the US dollar. Not undervalued, of course, not too cheap, but overvalued because of all the ridiculous consumption and, and the housing boom and the, and the reliance on foreign currency and the current account deficits and so forth. And so the managing director agreed with that. But soon, very soon thereafter, for personal reasons, he resigned, and a man named John Lipsky took over. He was the, he was the number two guy there. And at a meeting in his office, this document is a kind of a memo to the files um, recalling what happened at this meeting in Lipsky's office, where he decided, no, we are not going to bring the US dollar to the executive board. We are not going to call the US dollar fundamentally misaligned. And what's really kind of cool about this meeting is one of the arguments that was made, you can't see this in this snippet here, but one of the arguments that was made at that meeting for why they shouldn't call the dollar fundamentally misaligned was, no, okay, the US has these big current account deficits and it has all these problems, but no, no, people are pouring money into the dollar and pouring money into the United States for a very good reason, because its financial markets are marvelous mechanisms of intermediating money from abroad and allocating them to the most efficient lender. They're, they're fantastic. It's an amazingly stable and brilliant system. And no wonder people are pouring money into the United States. Well, that argument didn't, it doesn't turn out to look so good in retrospect. But anyway, so the US dollar was not going to be fundamentally misaligned. OK, so that's the most important currency in the world. And the IMF has just decided it's not fundamentally misaligned. Well, then we turn to one of the world's least important currency, the currency of the Maldives. And no, I can't find it on a map either. Um, but I'm sure many of you know that the currency of the Maldives is, is the rufia. Now, by any sensible definition, the Maldives rufia was a fundamentally misaligned currency. The economic policy of this tiny little country was wildly out of kilter. So management and staff agreed on that. We're going to go to the board. We're going to, we're going to, to bring them up on charges of fundamental misalignment. Then they ran into a problem. They went to the executive board. The, again, these are the people from uh, the member countries who meet uh, in the IMF building uh, several times a week. And, they were, uh, and when they were asked, will you name the Maldives Rufia as fundamentally misaligned? They basically said, you know what? We don't want to pick on this tiny little country. We just can't bring ourselves to do it. And this is an actual quote from the transcript of this meeting. The, direct, the director representing Egypt. Um, and doesn't, I mean, he represents Egypt in a sort of a whole group of constituencies of countries. He said, surely we do not wish our first assessment of fundamental misalignment to be attached to this small island economy. So, okay, Maldives also is lit. So let me skip ahead to what happened with China, because this is the country where it really mattered the most. The Chinese were basically saying, we're not going to engage. We won't want anything to do with this. We're not even going to, we're not going to have a board, we're not going to even allow you to have a board meeting to discuss our economy about whether we're fundamentally misaligned or not. And this is kind of, again, this is sort of the part of the excessive politeness of these bodies. Um, countries can do that. They can say, we don't want to have a board meeting. Uh, we want to have more consultations. We're not ready. And every, and the other board members say, oh, okay, you're not ready to have a board, we want, you don't have, and again, they're afraid that if they don't give China the right to do that, that Maybe China won't allow them to do it. So it's a kind of, again, it's a kind of mutual protection society. So China was delaying and delaying and delaying have a board meeting. So you can see from this email, I'm sorry, I was underlining all these documents that I was given before I, it occurred to me that someday I'd want to put them on a PowerPoint slide. But anyway, you can see that this, in this email, one of these IMF staffers says, the board meeting will be likely pushed back. Um, we are not sure how long the delay might, might take place. So, and at that point they were thinking it might be in end June. This was in 2008. So the US Treasury, was going crazy. They were really furious about this. And they wanted the IMF to call a board meeting, have the staff draw up a report saying the renminbi is fundamentally misaligned, and have a judgment be given against, against the Chinese currency. And a, this is a quote from, a, um, from a, uh, an IMF staff memo. 
were a Treasury staffer, a guy named Mark Sobel. Um, he conveyed his displeasure, his displeasure, quote, with great conviction, as you can see from the words there. And it also, the memo goes on to say that he was very clearly aware that his boss, that is Hank Paulson, who was then Secretary of the Treasury, was simultaneously giving a no take no prisoners message to Dominique Strauss-Kahn, who is then managing director of the IMF, right? Okay. Well, finally, the Chinese agreed to have a board meeting. The IMF management and staff really tried to persuade that we really have to have a board meeting on China. It's supposed to be a board meeting about every country every year. And finally, in the summer of 2008, a board meeting was finally set for September 22nd of 2008. Keep that date in mind. The Chinese finally agreed to have a board meeting. Partly, this gets into a little too much into the, into the thick of the details of the story, but they knew that, they, that the board wouldn't, they were quite sure that they would win the vote. But anyway, they agreed to have a board meeting. The U.S. wanted to have the thing come to the board meeting. They at least wanted the Chinese to be, to be embarrassed a little bit by having a board meeting at which some countries would say, yes, they're fundamentally misaligned. So they finally agreed to have a board meeting. And the IMF staff drew up a, a staff report which they were thinking that they might release publicly. And, it would, and, and this, is a, this is from that staff report, and it uses the term fundamental misalignment in connection with the Chinese renminbi. And that, so that report was sent around to board members. Well, what happened? That board meeting was never held. And that IMF staff report, that thing I just showed you there, that was never, never, never issued publicly by the IMF. And the reason? If you remember what was going on in September of 2008, September 15th of 2008, a date which will live in financial infamy was the bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers. Two days later was the bailout of American International Group. Saturday evening of that week, according to Hank Paulson's own book, he was calling Wang Qishan, the vice premier of China. Now, Paulson doesn't use the word begging in his book, but that's what he, he was begging the Chinese for a bailout of Morgan Stanley. I mean, if you read between the lines of his book, that's really what he was doing. And that meeting again, the board meeting at which China was supposed to be discussed, was scheduled for September, September 22nd, and basically a note went around saying, never mind, the board meeting is canceled. And it's, one of the senior officials who was involved in this whole episode said to me, well, I mean, and this was, you know, really kind of obvious. So the last thing we wanted in the middle of a crisis was a public row with China over its exchange rate policy. Remember, the world suddenly realized it needed China to help get out of the crisis. So in the end of this debacle, all countries escaped labeling. No, one, no currency was fundamentally misaligned, according to the IMF. So symmetry, at least, this great principle of John Maynard Keynes, that prevailed because no one was fundamentally misaligned. Everyone was treated alike. They were all let off the hook. So in a perverse sort of way, Keynes' principles went out, and the IMF had to beat a humiliating retreat. And in fact, in June 2009, the IMF basically said, we're not going to even think of you by using this term anymore because we can't use it in any, in any country's case. Now, you've heard me call these institutions feckless and clueless. Again, not because they're stupid people, but yes, they, have, they were feckless, and yes, they were clueless. But that doesn't mean, of course, I mean, after the crisis, People didn't just stand still and say, oh, well, everything's fine. We'll just leave things as they are. They, a lot of these institutions have been strengthened. And particularly, they were strengthened at the G20 summit in April of 2009 in London. And this is, uh, I was so happy when I saw this picture. I couldn't believe it. I, I mean, I don't think it was Photoshop, but if it was, what, what the heck? It kind of showed the mood that prevailed there. There was a lot, it really was the high water mark of international cooperation. And at that meeting, the IMF was endowed with significant new resources, and, and this, again, was the meeting where the FSF became the FSB, and that wasn't just a name change. It was the, the, F, the FSF, the FSB has a, a greater mandate to do more things, and particularly uh, there are obligations for member countries, and they're uh, obliged to undergo peer reviews, and, and they're supposed to agree to, to um, they're supposed to observe agreed international standards. And most importantly, all perhaps, the G20 replaced the G7, as a steering committee of the global economy. This is a huge advance in, 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 in strengthening of international institutions because these rising powers, China, Brazil, Russia, uh, India, being the most, you know, probably, you know, the most commonly cited, were, were, were invited to the, to the high table of, of global governance. And even after this meeting, a lot, of, a lot more has been done. The Basel Committee of, on Banking Supervision, that group I mentioned before, they had these rules before Basel II on, 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 
on banking, on bank uh, safety uh, standards, and they strengthened them. They, they, they moved in a very good direction with, with rules that are called Basel III. So these are strong, they have stronger rules. The FSB has intensified its supervision of these institutions, the sort of too big to fail institutions, banks, securities firms, insurance companies. Uh, they're, they're required to observe uh, higher standards than other, than other um, smaller institutions. And the G20 has launched something on global imbalances, which is called the Mutual Assessment Process. I'm going to come back to that very just briefly. At the very end, I'm almost finished. So, in given all these things that have been done after the crisis, the question, the obvious question, is: So, are international institutions now sufficiently robust, given all the challenges that that we face in the global economy? And I'm going to, um, with all due modesty, I'm going to submit that the evidence in my book provides ample grounds for answering that question: No. These, look, these enhancements that I just talked about are, they're laudable and they're helpful and they go quite far in the right direction, but they don't fundamentally alter the inconvenient truths that I mentioned at the beginning, but, which are the inability to discern how and why crises are likely to arise and the lack of power and will to crack down on national policies that might threaten neighboring countries or even the whole global system. Whoops, I'm sorry, I'm going the wrong direction here. And an example I'd like to cite in this regard is the, is the, mutual, the MAP, the Mutual Assessment Processes that the G20 has. This is, again, aimed at addressing mostly global imbalances. And this has been, you know, the, when the G20 launched the Mutual Assessment Process, it said, this is going to be great. This isn't going to be like that kumbaya singing thing that the IMF, exercise, uh, IMF organized, the, the multilateral consultations. We are going to have ownership of this ourselves. The IMF isn't going to be telling us what to do. We're going to all get together, and by God, we're going to point fingers at each other and we're going to exhort each other to do the right thing for the sake of the global economy. And I'm sorry, I, I, this, to me this just strains credulity. The G20, remember that phrase, great defensiveness and excessive politeness? The G20, again, this is a soft law body. It's a group of people who get together. They should get together. It's good for them, to all these leaders and finance ministers and foreign ministers to get to know each other and to interact with each other. I have nothing against it. But the idea that they are going to get together and engage in really frank discussion and engage in ruthless truth-telling and say, look, we're pointing the finger at you and you ought to do something about it. And then, the, and then the country that's getting its finger pointed at it would say, oh yeah, okay guys, I'm sorry, I'm letting you down. I'll change my policies. I'm sorry, particularly when you're talking about big powers, the US, China, the Eurozone, Great Britain. You know, your, your, your former Prime Minister, Paul Martin, put it, put it better. You can't shame the great powers because they have no shame. I mean, that puts it better than I could. Now, in the end of my book, I talk about, well, what if we had a really radical solution in the way that the IMF in particular is governed? You know, the, the World Trade Organization has a very, very, they have really hard law in the World Trade Organization. I mean, it's, it's not as hard as it could be, but it's pretty hard. When a country is found to be violating the rules of the world, of the international trading system, they, there are tribunals that can be formed if, if one country complains about another country. The tribunals consist of independent judges, and if they rule that, a, that, one, that some country is violating the rules, then that judgment it can be appealed to another group of, of independent judges. But the point is that you have independent umpires, independent judges making these judgments about whether tribunals are, are violating rules. And those rules apply to all countries, and they're enforceable. In other words, if a country is found in violation, they can have sanctions imposed against them. So it's not just a matter of, you know, shame on you. I mean, there can be actual economic pain imposed. It's not a perfect system by any means. I, I'm happy to talk about some of the flaws in it, but it, it, it's much harder law than any of the stuff that we've seen uh, it, it, that I've talked about this evening. Now, do I think that the, uh, such an approach is uh, likely to be adopted? Well, I think it's about as likely as the phenomenon that you see depicted in that picture. Um, however, having said that, unless we're going to adopt some really dramatic solutions of the kind I've just talked about, well, then I think the chances that international institutions will really force big countries to make major changes, the odds of that are also about the same as the phenomenon that you see depicted in that picture. So in the absence of really drastic solutions, then I, it's hard for me to feel terribly optimistic about our international institutions, even though they are vastly improved from where they were before the crisis. So I'm, I'm gonna stop there. I'm, I'm happy to, to um, discuss the, this kind of wacky idea I have for, for bringing WTO tribunals um, uh, into, uh, into the IMF system. Um, 
I would, I would argue that, you know, um, I'm, I'm really a journalist, um, as Fred's introduction made clear, uh, and so the work, the evidence that I presented about what went wrong, I think is perhaps more important than um, any of my policy prescriptions. Um, but anyway, I welcome your thoughts and thank you for your attention. And I guess I'm going to be, um, I'm happy to call on people um, who want to go to the mics. And I think, um, okay, I'm also seeing, uh, I kind of, I'm new to this, but uh, I'm seeing on the monitor here some questions that have kind of been piped in from, uh, from way out there. Um, the New Rules Coalition, which is a very good group that tries to improve governance of, um, of bodies like this, says, since the FSB hasn't corrected all the problems of the FSF, would a legally binding treaty-based FSB be appropriate and or stronger? Well, certainly, I think, you know, um, the short answer is yes. I think, you know, part of the problem with the FSB, the Financial Stability Board, this new institution um, that was created in April of 2009, again, it has many, many laudable qualities that, are, that, are, that mark an advancement over the FSF, but if it's going to be a ruthless truth teller, uh, it needs a more independent, it needs to be more of an independent body than it is. I mean, I don't think that, that that's a panacea. I don't think it's going to, I don't think that that's going to turn it into a great ruthless truth teller overnight, because it'll still have a lot of the deficiencies that you see on the IMF board. Remember, the IMF board couldn't even name the Maldives as fundamentally misaligned. I mean, that's how feckless they were. So if the IMF board can't even name them all to use as fundamentally misaligned, you, know, you really have to, and that's a, that's a treaty-based organization, then you have to wonder whether the FSB as a treaty-based institution would, well, how would it be at saying you know, to the US in 2007, you know what, you got a real problem in your housing market and all those subprime mortgages and your banks have, have gone, you know, they've gone haywire lending to them. Do I think that, um, that, uh, that such a thing would have been likely to either occur or to get the U.S. to change its policies, I kind of have my doubts. But there's no doubt that at least the FSB, I mean, all of these, all of these incremental changes, making these institutions more hard law, more, um, uh, more in the direction of ruthless truth-tellers, more independent, more... I mean, the FSB, to give you an example, the FSB has a staff, a secretariat, um, when it was the FSF, they only had seven people, and they were all seconded from international institutions. They weren't even their own. They only had one full-time staffer. Now they have about two dozen. But again, there's only, I think there's maybe two, now two full-time staffers, I can't remember. But anyway, there's about two dozen people, which is, a, which is a much better staff. But again, they're all seconded from finance ministries, central banks, um, other international organizations around the world. And if you don't have an independent staff, it's very difficult for these bodies to you know, to really be, to really say um, what ought to be said. So again, I'm not, I don't think it's a panacea. Um, I think it would be, you know, to answer the question, would it be appropriate and or stronger? Yes. Um, okay, so everybody just agrees with everything I said. All right, well, that's wonderful. Um, <laughs> uh, okay, here's a question. I'm going to get a drink of water while you're, because I'm running out of... If you come down here, sir, there's... Oh, oh, the mic that's, that's lit. <laughs> Fantastic. Paul, great talk. Um, I've been using the uh, uh, Pirates of the Caribbean line in my class for years. I'm glad other people appreciate it. Oh, my God. <laughs> I mean, oh well. sometimes, sometimes <laughs> at 9 o'clock in the morning, it's all you've got. Um, <laughs> I want to sort of get you to th put your journalist hat on for a second because... One of the things that we note about um, surveillance, and we talk about it being, you know, being toothless or being soft law, but one of the things that we note is that it doesn't get a whole lot of media attention. And even during um, 2011, when we were started talking in the U.S., we were talking about what to do about the budget, what to do about the debt, in a time that, that coincided with um, an IMF, uh, you know, a staff, uh, Article 4 review of the U.S., 
there's very little evidence that percolated in any discussions on Capitol Hill at all, even though the report had stuff that would make both the left and the right happy. So that having been said, when we think about the big picture here, then doesn't it also suggest that what the fund needs is a whole heck of a lot more engagement in terms of selling its selling the message and in that way that we can rely on domestic interests to mobilize Washington because obviously just talking across the street yes. isn't going anywhere. I completely agree with you. It's, it's appalling how little, you know, the IMF, when I was at the Post, you know, the IMF would sometimes try to get us interested in, in, in covering these so-called Article 4 reports. Article 4 refers to the, the, article, the fourth article of the IMF articles. Um, where the, the fund is obliged to uh, engage in, you know, quote unquote, surveillance of its member countries. And it's supposed to do one in every country every year. And um, some country, in some countries, uh, you know, when the IMF mission comes to do its Article IV uh, surveillance, uh, the press really turns out and the countries are, tend to be very sensitive to it. I live in Japan. Uh, the Japanese are very sensitive to what foreigners say about them generally. And I have to say that it, it, when the IMF comes and says something, the Japanese media gives it a lot of coverage. In the United States, it's like, who are they? <coughs> um, you know, there's these guys down on 19th Street, you know, who wear nice suits and, you know, but we're the United States. I mean, we, there's nothing wrong with us. Um, that's sort of the adage. Now, occasionally, um, uh, you know, papers will put these, put these things, you know, give them, give them prominent play. I, I think there ought to be a much more systemized effort to involve the media in, I haven't really thought about it in terms of Article 4, I can't really figure out how to do it with that, but one idea I've proposed in the past is with, with G20 meetings. I mean, okay, we have this mutual assessment process, and it's the best thing we got, and we ought to try to make it work better. What I would like to see, I mean, I would like to see the press used as a way of trying to embarrass the countries that need to do more to, uh, you know, if their policies are, are not really uh, fostering global economic well-being or if they're cheating on the rules in some way. Um, I wish that there were some system where the leaders were, would, would kind of agree that they would sit out and have press conferences um, where, and you'd, and you'd involve the think tanks too, because I've now become a think tank guy, so I'm trying to think of ways you bring the think tanks and the journalists together. And the think tanks, you'd have a group of think tanks who would say, we're, the, we're gonna be the independent judges, because we know these countries won't point the fingers at each other in the meetings in, a, in any kind of meaningful way, but we will point the fingers at countries that we see as problematic, and then give the journalists a chance to really give the leaders a hard time, and put them, and make them squirm um, at least that would, because what these summits are, I mean, they're, they're, they're two, they have two purposes. And a number of people who, you know, former, you talk to former diplomats, they'll tell you it's really wonderful when the leaders get together and they get to know each other and they can take walks in the woods and they can, you know, and they can really, and they can have a meal without their staffs and really bond. And I'm very skeptical. I mean, again, I, I see no harm in it, but I'm very skeptical that it produces much. What I think these summits are, they're action forcing events. The leaders know that if they show up and all they do is put out a communique that has a lot of hot air in it, that they'll be called, they'll be called on it. You know, the, the, the press the next day will say, ah, they didn't do anything. They're, they're, just, they're just, it's such a big photo op. So there is some, there is an action forcing element to these things, but I think that ought to be enhanced. And again, think tanks and the media could play, I think a much more, a much more public spirited role uh, if there were some kind of organized effort. You know, the problem with, uh, like the St., you know, the, the most recent summit, uh, G20 in St. Petersburg, all it focused on was Syria. Now, that's understandable. If you're going to get the world leaders, uh, you know, the G20 together, and you have this situation that's going on in Syria, the press, I know, I'm, I used to be a reporter, I know, all your editor wants you to do is find out what's going on with Syria. What are they saying on What are they agreeing to? What's Putin doing with, with Obama, with all that stuff? Perfectly legitimate news gathering. But 
if there were also some kind of mechanism built in, so, hey, remember the G20, remember G20, remember why you guys got together in the first place? Remember that thing called the global financial crisis? Remember you agreed you were gonna have something called the framework for strong and sustainable growth? And you remember you agreed to all these indicators that you were gonna look at and talk to each other about? And they still do. I mean, they did even in St. Petersburg to some extent. But the press paid absolutely no attention to that because the big story, but if you had a system, a, a real organized event at every G20 meeting to force a discussion about these economic issues that are terribly important, even if Syria was dominating the headlines, at least you would make these people come out and squirm. And they say, you know what? Um, nine out of 12 think tanks say that your economy ought to be doing more of X or Y or Z, whatever it is. And that leader could sit there and listen to those, and, and listen, hear question after question from reporters and have the world's, and have their own media cover that and say, you know, our chancellor, our prime minister, our president, whatever, was, was you know, was heckled, was hectored by the foreign media. It, it might have, might, might, might. Again, this is a kind of incremental improvement in the system that we can get. We don't have to go all the way to the hard, hard law WTO system that I, in my, in my wild flying pig imagination, um, like to invent which is never going to happen. But there are little things you can do to make the system of international cooperation work better. I think it's, instead of getting people together to sing Kumbaya, I mean, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just such a cynical journalist, I don't believe that <laughs> getting them in a room really makes them change anything. It helps, but doesn't change. But if you can, again, if you can push people, prod people, shame them, whatever it is with, by, by, you know, saying that your, the IMF report said this about you, this group of experts said that about you, at least it might, again, it might put pressure on and, and help mobilize support in the domestic constituencies in these countries to do something. Hi, Paul. Um, thank you so yeah, much for your yeah. talk today. Uh, much appreciated. And um, I guess my key question is, the, um, your book paints a picture of institutional failure, in which it's the design of these institutions, the way in which uh, members interact with each other. And I guess, for me, the issue is, is how much of this was an intellectual failure? Um, you know, your comments uh, just previously talk about how um, you know, getting these guys in a room, they don't tell each other that they need to behave better. But the issue was is that before the crisis, nobody was saying this needs to be done. There was no economic or regulatory consensus that subprime mortgages, collateralized debt obligations were, were a risk. And so I just wanted to get your thoughts on whether how much of this was the failure of the institutions and how much of this was the failure of the uh, intellectual paradigms that we understood these issues? And I think the big question that comes out of this is, it raises the hope of reform if it's an intellectual failure, whereas if the institutions can't change, then it has no hope. I, I, David, this is, this is David Kempthorne of CG, who knows more about, the, um, about these <laughs> bodies than I do. Um, uh, and I think that's a very good question. Another way of thinking about the intellectual failure is, is you can just sort of say, I mean, as smart as these people were, modern financial markets have become so complex and so overwhelmingly difficult to, to supervise that, um, that it's impossible for I mean, human beings have not yet evolved the brains. Even the smartest of us have not yet evolved to the point where we're going to be able to figure them out. And of course, once human beings evolve to that point, then they'll, be, they'll all be working for Wall Street anyway, and they'll have gotten <laughs> past the regulators. So, um, and I haven't, I don't really have a solution to that, you know? Um, I mean, boy, talk about flying pigs, right? So, uh, uh, I mean, partly, yes, there was an intellectual failure, which I, talk, and I, which, you know, which I mentioned, the market fundamentalism, the belief that markets will overcome all. And one kind of hopeful trend to counteract that is actually there, you know, there is some deglobalization going on. Um, super, uh, 
banking uh, regulators and supervisors in some of the biggest financial centers are starting to, to impose rules, as you, as you well know, on, on um, foreign institutions coming in. They're trying to avoid out and out financial protectionism, um, but you know it's hard to draw a line between being very prudent about letting a financial institution operate in your country. I mean, the, you know, the, one of these, some of the, the classic and really, you know, the, the horror stories about this were, you know, the Icelandic banks that were collecting deposits in the UK, and and um, uh, and then when Lehman Brothers went bust, I mean, it actually didn't have that bad of an effect in the U.S. in terms of chaos in the financial system. It had a huge, a terribly chaotic effect on, in in Europe and Japan. Um, where, where they just weren't ready for it and the rules hadn't been changed yet. But part of the problem was that, that because they were allowing foreign institutions to operate in their markets under, under their own rules without, without really um, obeying, uh, you know, integrating themselves into the way they, the, those, those other systems work, it, it, it just got, it became a terrible mess. So a lot of these countries are tightening their rules in terms of allow, with the, allowing foreign Financial institutions to come in. Another another trend in, in this another phenomenon here is um, uh, countries are now imposing more and more are imposing capital controls. They're trying to, to block foreign capital from, or imposing taxes on it from coming in in the first place. Um, to um, and the IMF, which used to think that this was a terrible thing to do and you're interfering in the market, is now saying, well, there are you know there are more conditions under which we're willing to say that this isn't such a bad thing. So I'm not sure I'm really answering your question, but um, some of this, some of the, because I think the regulators in, these are primarily national regulators, have, have realized that, you know, these markets are too much for us. Um, we can't just let them, we, you know, intellectually, we, know, we, can't, we can't figure out how to get our arms around them and to, and to and to um, make sure that they're stable. So we're going, so especially to the extent that there are spillovers from abroad, we're going to do, we're going to, you know, we're going to start to impose some rules to limit the excesses. We're not going to be market fundamentalists. Um, so, you know, I, I don't think that should be taken too far, but, but um, it, it may at least mitigate um, uh, the problem. And, um, but I, you know, I wrestled with this. I don't know how you overcome um, this problem of the just bodacious complexity. Um, you know, we've certainly learned the lesson that you can't just trust markets. Um, and, and I mean, even even Alan Greenspan will say, "Boy, <laughs> I was sure wrong about that, wasn't I?" Mm. Um, but um, how you structure these institutions to do better at that. Um, I've wrestled with it, and all I can, again, I mean, uh, I'm you know I'm not a policymaker, so thank God I don't have to come up with a solution. But as a journalist, I can say to you, um, you know, don't be too optimistic when the G20 come out and tell you, oh, we've got the institutions now that are going to fix this problem. Hi, I really liked your graphic of the falling U.S. dollar. I thought that captured perfectly the sense of panic that sometimes accompanies changes in currency, so it's a great graphic. But what I thought I would ask you is you've mentioned already the complexity of financial markets and how untransparent they are because they're just so complex. Was there, when you look through the uh, assessment of how the crisis emerged and why they didn't see the crisis, was there an idea of, well, this model almost showed us or that economic assessment almost indicated that this was the problem. Was there any sense that you, they could use what they almost saw or what they failed to see as a jumping off point for a new economic model or a new way of developing kind of a big red button that says panic or a big <laughs> flaming sign that says exit now that they could show to the people who have the political will or the political power to say this is happening, we have to impose these actions now to avert a crisis or are they still too afraid to do that because of what happened in the Great Depression? They're, um, you know, they've been trying to improve. The, the, the IMF and the FSB have something called an early warning exercise, um, which, you know, is a big effort to try to really narrow down. Not, and they, they realized that they, you know, they looked 
too much, at, you know, too many, too many different possible risks. So now they're trying to pick the top three, or the top two, or whatever, whatever they, whatever some narrow group of risks are. And they present these this meeting in private to the uh, IMF board and to the FSB once uh, once or twice a year. And uh, again, I mean, I think that's a better way of going about this, that kind of exercise. Um, I have to tell you, I. If you go through the literature on on this kind of on of you know financial crises in modern times, you will see that in 1975, when the Basel Committee was set up, one of their first things that they were told to do was have an early warning exercise. I mean, every when Gordon Brown was Chancellor of the Exchequer and Prime Minister, I mean, I have a lot of admiration for Gordon Brown. I think he's a you know, I mean, he's a tragic figure. Very smart guy, my God. I mean, when he, boy, you go in a press conference with him and, and you'd think, ask him what you thought was a tough question and he'd just blow you away. But he had these, he would, he would have these ideas in his mind that all we need is early warning exercises. Why aren't we doing early warning exercises? Every international meeting he would raise this. And you, know, you could see people in the audience going, yeah, early warning exercises. But it was just reinventing the wheel. I mean, it was kind of, I'm sorry, it was kind of like my... Um, my uh, Captain Barbosa thing. I didn't realize I was reinventing the cliche, but um, uh, I'm not sure that, again, that I'm really responding to your question. I don't think that there was a model that they could say, well, looking back on it, we can now see. Because, again, it was, um, it involved such a complex web of connections. And there's still, you know, debates still rage after all. Economists are still arguing, you know, how important were global imbalances in the crisis? How important was government interference in housing markets in the United States? I mean, personally, I think that argument is kind of over. Uh, I, I think it's been settled in no government interference in housing markets in the United States wasn't the problem. It was the markets in the United States. It wasn't the government. The government should have been stepping in a lot more. But anyway, there's still, there's, there is debate about it. So... Um, Again, this kind of comes is sort of a similar question. Uh, you know, uh, is there some is there some model? Is there some intellectual exercise we could do that would solve it? And again, I, all I can do is say, well, uh, I'm kind of I'm not terribly optimistic. We can we can do you know try to we, you know be very chastened by what what happened and be a lot more vigilant. Um, but. Um, you know, one of the problems, another problem with financial crisis is you always end up fighting, it's like wars, you always end up fighting the last one. And you're looking for the same things that caused the last crisis, and then it's something new, you know, that, that, that bites you. Um, that's, that's the nature of these things. So, uh, <laughs> but it's a very good question. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Hi. The information these particular institutions are having uh, may only cover a portion of what gross world domestic product is because we have things like uh, um, drug trade, we have you know, non-reported incomes, cash flows, etc. Uh, an example uh, in the uh, mortgage crisis, my brother's an appraiser in the western states and uh, his contacts in both uh, California and uh, Florida indicated that appraisers being um, getting licenses in those two states, about 20% of them were, had felono, felonious records. Mm -hmm. And the, the, many of the mortgage-backed securities okay, came up from projects that didn't exist or had uh, one-tenth of what was in the ground there. We have uh, our Western drug trade uh, expanding to other places in the world. So if you're making decisions on, on whether these crises are going to happen, if you've only got a small, well, if you've only got X number of proportion and you haven't got Y in that equation, how are you ever going to, to uh, come to a, uh, a point of saying a crisis is about to develop? Well, that's another aspect of the complexity of it, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> Um, I, don't, I don't know that I think that that type of unlawful activity was crucial. I mean, 
I think uh, the problem was that a lot of the activity, well, you know, really, the, the activity that caused the crisis, I think I can say with a fairly high degree of confidence, was mostly entirely illegal. Um, it was immoral. Um, it, was, it was outrageous that regulators uh, didn't crack down on it more than they did and try to pass laws against it uh, or bring, bring it to the attention of Congress to, to do something about it or use the regulatory powers they had to to rein it in. I mean, this was one of the, this is certainly the greatest failing of the Federal Reserve, in my opinion. The illegal, you know, the illegal activity of the kind you're talking about, um, you know, it it certainly exacerbated the problem, I'm sure. But I, I think even without even without any, you know, really off the books, felonious activity, we would have had the crisis anyway. Mm -hmm. I think, but you may be right. I mean. <laughs> How am I doing on time? I'm sorry, I, I, I can't wear a watch because I'm allergic to nickel. Um, and nobody has yet bought me a gold watch, although I've retired from the Washington Post. Uh, but uh, I mean, are we basically finished? Yes, there's another question. But I'm yeah, okay. <laughs> just my luck, Fred gets up at the same time as I do. Um, my question is just a little bit of your observation of a Canadian perspective. Um, from my point of view and my observations back there, in 2008, we were extremely lucky, and I, I will not claim highly skilled or educated in any way to avoid the worst of the crisis. Certainly the manufacturing impact spilled over here in a huge way, particularly in Ontario. But do you have any perceptions or observations that Canada did something different or better or provides a little different model maybe like well not being quite as entangled I should have mentioned that you know since I am here you know um, aside from um, aside from making my little joke about how you spell the word honor um, yeah you did a lot of things right absolutely that guy whose picture I showed you at the beginning um, I mean I don't know that it was so much the Bank of Canada as your as your financial regulators um, uh, you know, you had a better better control over your banks than we did in the United States. Uh, you have you have big banks. I mean, this is this is you know often Canada is often cited as an example. Well, you know these people who say break up the big banks. Well, look at Canada. Canada has big banks, and yet you didn't have you didn't have a financial crisis here. You certainly had you had the backwash of the effect from the United States, but you know that's not your fault. Um, that's our fault. Um, but. You know, again, and this, this is, I think I'm really glad you raised this because I don't want to make it sound as if international coordination is the be all and end all. The most important thing in the health of the world economy is that individual, especially the most important countries get it right. And my country is doing uh, one heck of a job lately. Did you, have you read about the government shutdown? I mean, aren't we doing a terrific job? <laughs> to worry about. But anyway, that's the most important thing, is that, is that we, is that, you know, probably the most important thing is that the United States run its economy better. So international coordination is, is in some ways a secondary consideration. But without good international coordination, um, you know, a lot of countries can run, their, can run their economies well. And this, again, Canada's a great example. You ran your financial system extremely well, and yet you got whacked because you happen to be next to the country where we didn't do such a good job of running our financial system. So um, that's a, I, I'm really glad you raised that point because I, 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 again, I don't want to sound like international cooperation or coordination or whatever you want to call it, where international institutions, they're not going to solve all our problems. Uh, it's up to individual countries to, to you know, do the really hard stuff. without my notes, which I dropped. Uh, first of all, I want to say uh, thank you to Paul Bluestein. You know, since the uh, global financial crisis, which 
let's not forget, cost millions of jobs globally and, and wiped out trillions of dollars worth of uh, wealth worldwide. A lot of people have been able to analyze and commentate on the reasons and the known facts, the currency values, the stock market, and what happened. But I think what uh, Paul brought uh, to this uh, analysis uh, uniquely, uh, because of his talents as a reporter, were the secret documents behind the scenes that showed uh, what was going on at the meetings behind closed doors of the people responsible for regulating, the people responsible for averting these sorts of crises and managing them, and, and the, uh, the inertia, the, um, the missed opportunities. You've brought that into the light, and although you call it a dispiriting story, I'm really quite uh, enthralled by this story. I think it's wonderful that you were able to do that. So for writing this book, for exposing those truths, and uh, for coming here all the way from Japan, uh, thank you very much for this uh, presentation. So a few quick comments just before we adjourn tonight. Uh, tonight's video will be edited and posted online, and there'll be a blog online in a couple of days that you can uh, comment on if you want to continue the discussion. Um, we want to thank uh, you for coming out here tonight, and Paul's book, Off Balance, is available at a special discount price, post-financial crisis price of uh, $20 <laughs> out in the lobby. Paul will be available to uh, sign those books if you like, which doubles the value on eBay. <laughs> and also, I'd just like to remind you of a few upcoming events. Uh, tomorrow night, we have another lecture from Mike Holm, who's a professor at King's College uh, University in London, speaking about 25 years of climate change, just surveying what's occurred in the global conversation around climate change in a quarter century. Um, and so that, and then next week on October 30th, the night before Halloween, we invite you to hear the first public lecture by the new director of the Balsley School of International Affairs, John Ravenhill, a renowned and esteemed internationally uh, um, experienced scholar on global governance, talking about the crisis in global governance, so please come to hear John Ravenhill. Thank you again for coming tonight and a safe journey home.